would introduce uh, our third keynote speaker, uh, Bruno Estigarribia uh, from uh, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, um, who is going to be talking about incomplete standardization, challenges and choices in grammar writing. Thank you very much, Lily and Rita, for both for the uh, opportunity and really great honor of writing um, this reference grammar um, and also for the invitation to give this keynote. Uh, I am going to share my screen now. While I do that, I wanted, I wanted to reiterate my um, greetings to our Jewish colleagues. Shana Tova. It's, um, it's a good time of the year. And um, here, if you can see my screen, I am trying to figure out which way the cursor goes to move between the two monitors. It goes the other way, so good. One more thing that's harder to do. <laughs> Another challenge, but yeah, we can see it. Great, thank you very much. Um, so uh, these thanks are really, really heartfelt, and um, I really wanted to thank Lili and Rita and the team at UCL Press um, it's hard to publish a grammar. There are so many things to take into account, uh, but it was very enjoyable. So I recommend it to anybody who may be interested in writing one um, to publish it with UCL Press. Um, I will talk about open access a little bit later, very important. Um, but emotionally, this is a very important project for me um, because my dad is from Paraguay and um, lives in Paraguay and um, all these years I've been working on the language have been um, just a little bit of a way to, for me to get a little closer to him, even though he's far away. Um, so thank you. So um, I will talk a little bit about the grammar. We'll talk a little bit about the language. Um, and I hope to give a little bit of an inkling of what choices I had to make uh, we had to make with the whole team in, in bringing this grammar to fruition and in turning into a um, product that we think is going to be, we hope it's going to be very, very useful to a broad audience. So I, I've been working on Guarani for, I guess, the last 10 years. Um, I've been working on several aspects of it. For example, I have published work in uh, Journal of Child Language and um, Hispania on Guarani Spanish mixing, which is a very, very important topic in the study of Paraguayan Guarani today, and it will figure importantly in the presentation to follow. Um, I also um, have worked on uh, linguistic analysis and description of what one may want to call Guarani proper. Uh, this is often called Guaraniete. Uh, meaning true Guarani in the literature and in the community. That term is used both by researchers and community members. Um, so um, I have worked on derivational morphology and on some exceptional nasal harmony patterns in the language. Um, these two works will appear, the first one in a first shrift for Bartomeu Melia, one of the most important scholars in the study of Guarani, who recently passed away. And um, the other one is going to appear in International Journal of American Linguistics. Um, in the course of these 10 years that I've been working on this, uh, very early on, uh, one realizes that there isn't really a good place for an English speaking audience to get a compendium of Guarani structures, Guarani grammar. Um, in 2017, uh, um, a former student of mine and I co-edited a book where we um, invited um, a few of the most important scholars in the field uh, to um, share their newest analyses of Guarani linguistics. And we edited this book. Um, and that book has a chapter that is a mini sketch grammar of Guarani. And that chapter was what, writing that chapter was what gave me the impetus to actually try to write a more complete description of the language. 
The main reason is that if you're looking for a complete grammar of Guarani in English, uh, your only choice is the one you see on the left here, uh, which is very famous and rightly so. Uh, and it is from 1967, so over 50 years ago. Uh, it's written in a completely different, from a completely different theoretical paradigm. It's organized and even typeset in ways that we wouldn't do it today. Um, it's also, if I'm not mistaken, based on um, data from a few speakers from Argentina who were already living in abroad and not in Paraguay. And so we believed, I believed, and the team, the editorial team believed it was time to actually have a broad coverage, comprehensive description of the grammar of the language for a Spanish speaking, for an English speaking audience. Um, and that's what we set out to do. So I am going to tell you a little bit about the language. Uh, many of you may know quite a bit about it, perhaps, um, so that we can contextualize a little bit some of the challenges and choices I refer to in the title of the talk. So Guarani is a member of the to be Guarani family that has about 40 to 50 languages. These two images are from the grammar from chapter one. You can see on the left the uh, putative homeland of the to be Guarani languages. And on the right, you can see a figure from Walker, Walker et al. Uh, 2012 that depicts the successive migrations and the current extent of this family. In, in the Amazonian and, and adjacent regions. Paraguayan Guarani is situated here. And um, we have a long history of both contact and documentation of Guarani. And this sets the language apart from many other things that we could do as um, language field workers, language descriptors, linguists who do language description. Um, Guarani, as Rita said at the beginning, is not an endangered language, even though this is the foundation for, it, for Endangered Languages Conference. Um, yet, it is a minoritized language, and I, and I want to explain a little bit how that comes about, that it's a very vibrant language in the modern world, and still obviously a minoritized language that is deserving of more of our attention. So the, Span the Spanish crown uh, founded Asuncion in 1936, if I remember correctly. Um, and and uh, they didn't really uh, send a lot of people there <laughs> to say it uh, uh, in, a, in an easy way. Um, which meant that very quickly, even the, um, the ruling classes were uh, of mixed race, right? Uh, they were perhaps um, sons, mostly, of Spanish colonizers and of uh, Guarani-speaking mothers. So that is what we, we take to be the beginning of the extensive Guarani bilingualism, Guarani-Spanish bilingualism in Paraguay. Um, and I put square quotes on bilingualism because uh, what an, Paraguay isn't a bilingual language, as is often called. It's actually a multilingual language where there are very many other languages that are endangered um, and do not have the recognition of this or the support of the state that Guarani has. But Guarani is very well documented. We have um, grammars from the early 17th century on, uh, written by Jesuits um, who learned and used Guarani in the Jesuit missions. Um, and these have, uh, are an incredible source of um, uh, knowledge about the language. They're extremely well written, especially considering this is from the 16th century. Um, very keen analysis of the language. Um, Guarani, also survived because he is very important uh, in the construction of the identity of Paraguayan people. So on the left uh, here of the slide, you can see um, a picture from what are called the Periodicos de Trinchera, so the wartime uh, newspapers in Paraguay. This is from the 1860s, 
when Paraguay was fighting the Triple Alliance War against Argentina, Brazil, and Uruguay. And in, in that, during that war, and in the period leading to the Chaco War against Bolivia in 1932, um, Guarani was the nationalistic rallying cry for Paraguayans. It was the thing that differentiated them from their non-Guarani speaking neighbors. And so we have written data on Guarani uh, since like the end of the 19th century. And today you can see here as a token of the, you know, evidence of the vitality of the language, um, it has a quite an important presence online as well. Firefox, for example, has uh, a version that is completely in Guarani. It's called Aguara Tata. Aguara means fox. Tata means fire. And uh, there's a Wikipedia, which is the Guarani Wikipedia that has a substantial amount of, of of articles. Um, Guarani is used in uh, social media quite extensively. Um, it is a very vibrant language. Um, it was declared in 1992 in the last Paraguayan constitution, a co-official language of Paraguay with Spanish. That is a big victory for Guarani. As I mentioned before, it's less of a victory for the dozens of other languages that coexist in that territory that get no recognition. But it was a big victory for Guarani because the constitution mandates education and access to education in Guarani for any family that chooses it for their children, their offspring. Um, and it mandates equal use um, in educational, administrative and other formal contexts. Um, 20 years later, this is from the census, the last complete census uh, from Paraguay. You can see the figures of Guarani, Spanish, and Portuguese speakers. Guarani is spoken by about six to seven million people, um, six million in Paraguay, seven, one more in the diaspora, more or less. Um, it is the only Amerindian language that is spoken by a non ethnic, indigenous, ethnically indigenous uh, population. The population of ethnic Guarani um, inhabitants in Paraguay is about 2%, but about 80% of the population or a little bit more speaks Guarani. That's a history of success and it's also a tragedy, right? It's a, it's a tragedy and success that is embedded in this story, the tragedy that we only have 2% indigenous um, inhabitants. But Guarani is in many respects compared to other Amerindian languages, a success story. And part of the interest in talking about Guarani in, in an endangered languages conference is to figure out ways in which what we do, what we have done with Guarani, what the speakers have done and what we do with Guarani can inform our processes, our ideas, our thoughts, our projects with other languages that haven't been as successful. So when you propose a grammar or a book to a publisher, you need to argue that actually such a book needs to be published. So I'm gonna have some slides about the need for a, this kind of reference grammar of Guarani. Most of the grammars you can find if you're starting to study the language or starting to do research on the language are published in Spanish, obviously. And, and they are what I call um, um, scholastic traditional slash traditional grammars. Um, they um, usually hew very closely to the categories and types of analysis you find in a Spanish grammar. Uh, the power of, of Spanish norms is very great in Paraguayan society as well. And so that plays a big role in how the language is described. Um, and you, he you have here, for example, the, the uh, a couple of pages on the cover of the 2018 um, 
official grammar of the language published by the uh, Guarani Language Academy, which is a governmental body. It's the first official grammar of the language. And it, what's interesting, what's very interesting about it, is that it is a grammar written for Guarani speakers, really. Because when you look at it, the grammar is bilingual. You can see the page in the middle is in Spanish. The page in the right is actually the same information, but in Guarani. That is fantastic, right? Because one of the issues with standardization is, can we have a, a conventionalized way of talking about these things in the, lang in the object language, right? Can we use the object language as a meta language? But when you look at the examples, they don't have a translation. So if you don't speak Guarani, it's, the examples aren't really very useful because you don't know what they mean, right? Um, other grammars uh, that are of this type um, are, for example, the grammar on the left is by Felix de Guarania and the grammar of the right is by Tadeo Sarratea. These are two very important figures in um, Paraguayan uh, literature. And um, they have uh, very useful um, data, right? But they focus mm, quite exclusively on the morphology of the language. And again, they hew quite closely in many cases to the categories that one inherits from the study of Spanish grammar. Um, and so their coverage isn't wide enough. They are useful because they have a lot of detail in some aspects of the morphology of the language, but they also fall prey to what uh, Curzon calls uh, restorative prescriptivism, which is the need to uh, analyze and put forth a prior stage of the language that is considered more pure or like an ideal to tend to towards when in the process of standardization. It, so it's hard to know when you see all of these morphemes, for example, these mood morphemes, which ones are in common use in spoken language and which ones are really not in, in common use. And the examples as presented you know, this is quite typical of these kinds of grammars. They're not really contextualized. They're mostly, in this case, verb forms and so on. So a little bit of the information you would want, both as a linguist and as a language learner, is absent from here. There is a, a, another Spanish language grammar by Crivochein de Canese and Acosta Alcaraz, which has a more of a linguistic bent. And it was very helpful for me also in uh, my studies on the language and in the composition of this grammar. Um, again, the coverage is mostly about the morphology of the language and the, the examples aren't really contextualized um, enough so that a linguist would get um, enough information to, for example, for typological um, um, projects. But it's a very good grammar, right? It just focuses mostly on morphology, and it's in Spanish. And it's not, it doesn't really have linguistic analysis, even though it has more of a linguistic bend. On, on the left is the last Spanish language grammar I want to mention. It's by Val Jose Valentina Ayala. It's from 1996. It was published in Argentina. And honestly, this grammar is incredible. Uh, it has so much data with such good intuitions about what morphemes mean, how they're used. It's really a, a very good grammar, except that it's not organized in a very user-friendly way. Um, and especially if you're interested in typology, for example, and, and, and in, in reading a grammar that's comparable to other grammars, this one is hard. It's hard even for a linguist. It's, it's hard going. Um, on the right, we have a very good grammar of the morphology of Paraguayan Guarani by Guido Kalfel, who published it in 2011. This grammar um, is in German. There is a 2016 translation into Spanish. Um, it, it's very detailed. It's very good for linguists. Um, it's, again, not 
necessarily very accessible to people who are not linguists because it's extremely technical. So again, a very good grammar with very good linguistic information, not necessarily accessible to a broad audience. So this was the panorama when, as I was thinking about writing this grammar, it's, it was that we needed, we really need, needed a grammar in English that was a compendium a broad coverage compendium of the main syntactic, uh, not syntactic, grammatical structures of Guarani that included phonology, that included morphology, but that also included syntax, a little bit of semantics, some discourse analysis. Um, I wanted to write a grammar that was linked to a more modern linguistic approach in current typological concerns. It was important for UCL Press and for me that this grammar um, reach a broad audience. So not only for linguists, but also for people who are interested in language because they are, for example, they study Paraguayan literature. So Paraguayan poetry that has Guarani in it or Paraguayan theater or ethnographers or anthropologists. So people who are not necessarily trained linguists who can slog through a linguistically written grammar, but who still need to have knowledge of the language. And so that's the reason I couldn't really ignore uh, pedagogical issues in the grammar. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. And one very important thing for me from the very beginning in doing this was that this grammar was going to be open access. And I cannot say enough how important I think this is. I think people will generally today agree. Um, we cannot work in a vacuum and we cannot work so that only the people who are most fortunate can get access to what we do. We need to make what we do accessible to a very, very, very broad segment of the population. And open access is one part of, for one tool to fulfill that goal. Okay, so now I'm going um, straight into um, showing you a little bit of what the grammar looks like. I'm going to exemplify some of the challenges that I found and some of this uh, that I encountered and some of the solutions that I found in writing the grammar. There is probably more I could say, um, um, or I, you know, if you're interested in any aspects that I am not talking about during this slide presentation, feel free to ask anything you want during the Q&A. So I think the first challenge that I actually had to think very carefully about um, was the issue of variety selection. So Guarani is still undergoing a process of standardization and even the step of codification, which includes selecting a variety, isn't really completed. So Guarani, because of the extensive five century contact with Spanish, is really spoken and used today in Paraguay more as a mixed lect. It's a term from Ad Bacchus that I've used before. That is, productions by Paraguayan Paraguayans really situates them, themselves in a continuum where you can have more Guarani-like productions or Guaraniete-like productions. Guaraniete means true Guarani, and it's often used to refer to a variety of Guarani that's as purged as possible of Hispanisms and Spanish influence. But you can, you can find productions that go all the way to productions that are what I'm calling here Casteni, following terminology by Gomez Rendon, um, that are almost Spanish, actually. You can see in these examples on the slide, the Spanish um, lexemes or, and, and morphemes are bold-faced here. So... There is a big and very heated debate, obviously, in the Paraguayan community as to which variety should be codified for standardization with proponents of a more purist approach, uh, thinking that this is the opportunity 
to do a bit of restorative prescriptivism, purge Guarani from all the Spanish influence and create a more guarani version of the language that will be used in formal context and that hopefully trickles down to the population with education, right? Other people think that actually the closer you are to the spoken language, the better. So the actually Jopara in some form, so the mixed code should be codified because codifying an acrolect is obviously a way of further disenfranchising the, the speakers who don't possess it, right? And this is a very heated debate. And um, I am not Paraguayan, so I am very careful. I'm not a member of that community. I am not a native speaker of the language. Oops, I just hit my microphone. Um, I didn't want to take sides. I think it is important because I am not a member of the community, but also because the grammar really is aimed at people from a broad audience, possible language learners. And I think it's very important that anybody reading this grammar gets a good sense of the variety of uses that are in, in use today in Paraguayan society, that we do not expose them to an artificially standardized version that is only a part of what they will encounter when they interact with the language in any capacity. So this st stops short perhaps of being what is called a polylectal grammar, right? It doesn't really have um, a comparison between different lects or, or an extensive analysis of how the lects differ. But I made very clear from the beginning in the introductory chapter to the readers that my job was not to prescribe which variety is the one that they should be using, but actually to give them a window into the language that would allow them to interact um, with the whole range of productions they can encounter from Paraguayan speakers. So in order to do that, I had two things that uh, guided my composition very strongly. I wanted examples to be exemplified to <laughs> I wanted it, uh, language data to exemplify very clearly the analytical uh, or grammar points I was making in each section. Um, and, but I also wanted the data to be ecologically valid. These are two things that I think are missing from the extant grammars. So I'm going to do, I'm going to give um, examples in what follows um, as to how I um, chose to exemplify the language. But I'm going to talk about ecological validity briefly here. Um, as I said before, I'm not a native speaker of the language, so I really, really stayed away from uh, creating my own examples, ex except in the cases where I really needed a clear contrast between, for example, two forms. And in that case, well, I created a contrast, usually based on a, a naturalistic example and changing it a little bit. But I really seriously, studiously avoided doing that, um, even for the clearest, most simple morphological paradigms. It was important for me that the data I presented had ecological validity. That is that they are real data produced in real contexts uh, by speakers. And as you can see, that means that a lot of the exemplification is you know, it's, it serves a little bit like a mini corpus, right? It's not only a collection of forms. You get full sentences, you get sentences with context, you get texts, as I'm going to show towards the end of the talk. Um, so I'm, I'm quite happy with having made that decision, even though, as I will show a little bit, that can, uh, in, in a little bit, that can, um, that makes the examples a little harder to parse, perhaps. Okay. One of the first things I want to say is that I did, even though I'm a linguist, and I think this grammar is very useful for linguists, I did keep non-linguist learners 
fully in mind throughout the composition of the grammar. And I decided that this required the introduction of very early sections in chapter one that were really aimed at learners. Okay, so for example, there's an early section where I discuss and introduce people to what they can expect from the contact between Guarani and Spanish and other languages in Paraguay. Um, so I have, for example, this table where I can see, look, you're going to see all these words. People are going to complain about these words sometimes. But these are used very broadly in Paraguay today. They do come from Spanish. Okay. And you will find them in texts, in speech. Then I also included something that's missing from most grammars I, I saw because they're probably not really um, focusing on learners' needs. Uh, it's a very basic pronunciation summary at the beginning so that people, when they interact with the written word, they have an, an idea of how these words sound. And that actually facilitates parsing, I believe. Um, a, a lot of the approach I took for these, for these sections was really informed by my work with uh, the French company, Asimil, for example, that I mentioned in the acknowledgments to the book. Um, I've been thinking for about 20 years pretty consistently, if not formally, about second language learning and in particular how second language learning proceeds in a self-directed fashion. And some of the ideas that came to me from that expertise writing these kinds of methods for a, for a company that, uh, that publishes self-directed language learning methods show in these kind of pronunciation summaries, like what, what to tell people to pay attention to, how exactly to explain, both in a technical way, so that a typologist, a phonologist will find what I'm referring to in the grammar, but also with a, in a sort of non-technical way, um, how to articulate, for example, sounds of Guarani, and there's other pointers in this section that I think are important for learners of the language, even for linguists. This is an important section too. Because the, the orthography is really not yet completely standardized, although it's quite close to achieving, I think, a consensual status because the Academy just published an official grammar that's going to carry a lot of weight and they are preparing an official dictionary and that's also going to carry a lot of weight. The truth is Guarani has so many decades, centuries of documentation that you are going to find an enormous array of different orthographies for it. And so I provided the reader with some, um, with a table where I summarized the most important divergencies they can find in the hopes that that would help readers engage with texts from other eras that actually do not use the orthography that's currently being recommended. This one also, <laughs> I like this one, because uh, probably uh, L2 researchers, people who seriously research second language acquisition, which I don't, are going to find fault with this. But I, I just wanted to give pointers for students. L lay people who are not polyglots usually do not know quite well how you go about studying a language. Um, personal impression. Uh, I think it was important to tell people, look, if you really want to study a language for speaking or for knowing as a, as a speaker, as a native speaker, you need to practice different abilities with the language, talking, writing, listening, reading, etc. cetera. Um, and so this uh, small section, I think it's only two or three pages, has some pointers so that people can um, approach this, the, the task of learning where I need with a more solid base uh, in how to go about learning a language with the little that there's out there to learn what I need actually. Um, okay. And those are the specifically learner oriented sections. Now, the treatment of exemplification is one of the clearest places in the grammar where you can see the tension between writing for writing something that's useful for linguists, useful for typologists, and writing something that is not forbidding and is also useful for a non-technical reader. So we, uh, we came to 
this solution in conversation with uh, the two editors of the series, Guarani, as you can see here, is an agglutinating language. So parsing examples in Guarani is quite hard, right? Because segmentation is difficult, especially written examples where you don't have any other kind of uh, context to parse the example. So we decided that we were going to do interlinear glossing for every example in the book. The main line is in italics, and then there's the um, free translation, although sometimes the translation is quite literal. That was my personal choice for some examples. And in between, but in a smaller font, we get the two, intergloss, the two interglossing, interlinear glossing lines that we are familiar with. I tried to have as few technical abbreviations as possible. So for example, I didn't use locative for pe, or I didn't use ablative for uh, gui. But in some cases, obviously, because Guarani has categories that don't translate well into, well into English, I had to use technical abbreviations, and those are summarized at the beginning of the book. Another thing I did for examples was, um, you know, sometimes I wish uh, this was done more broadly in linguistics papers. I'm reading a paper on a foreign language, on a language I don't know, and I'm having a lot of trouble parsing the example, even with the morphemization. I'm not sure what exactly I'm needing to focus on. I did not want readers to have to deal with that. And so I used um, boldface pretty liberally on the, on the main line to highlight um, in each case what the morpheme or the word being exemplified is. And I underlined whatever corresponded to it in the English translation, if there was a correspondence. Sometimes there wasn't. Now this example uh, helps me to talk about something else. Again, I said the, or the orthography has just now reached a point where I think there um, has emerged a consensus on how to write things, M but many texts will have non-standard orthographies. And in many cases, the speakers will follow the recommendations of the academy, for example, writing this uh, bisyllabic postposition as a separate word, which I don't think necessarily make sense from a po the viewpoint of a morphological analysis. I think this word is a clitic and maybe, maybe it would be better to write it together with the, with the host. But in any case, I did um, follow my analysis in the morphemization line. So even though the word is written as an independent word, I did mark it as a clitic. And the grammar has a few, not very many, but a few of those, um, I don't want to call them inconsistencies, but it's places where perhaps the original orthographic rendering of the source differs with my morphological analysis. And by the way, I really tried to keep uh, the original rendering of the examples as it was. I tried not to change them um, at all, except in a few cases where I thought that the original orthography or the original separation in words could confuse the reader, then in those cases I sort of normalized the main line a little bit, but I didn't do it very often. Another thing that, um, so here you can see that, you know, the grammar has some long examples that have a long morphological analysis, and in these ones, I think for these ones, it's really useful to have um, uh, bold face and um, underlining working together in this fashion. Um, the grammar also has these blue bold face terms, which are technical terms that are necessary because linguists, again, need to find those terms in the grammar. Um, but all of these are recapitulated in a pretty extensive glossary where I defined each term in as accessible a language as I could. And so these, these terms uh, refer to entries in that glossary. Okay. So, okay. I talked a lot about my concern for uh, non-linguist readers, but I was also concerned that the linguists would get uh, an inkling of what my own ideas about grammar 
the grammar of Guarani war. And so I'm going to show you very briefly some sections where I used this um, reference grammar to put forth analyses that maybe are not the way things are, are presented in grammars of Guarani. For example, in voices, um, I defined an active voice and a passive and an inactive voice uh, for verbs, which in traditional slash scholastic grammars of the language, they are just considered um, different classes of verb. The areal class, because it takes a prefix a, and the shendal class, because it takes a prefix she. And you cannot see it here, because I cut it out for the slide, but my grammar is in dialogue with those scholastic grammars. I make reference to those uh, traditional ways of talking about these categories in the grammar so that people can relate um, the context, the, the analysis I'm giving here with the analysis that's normally given. Um, I also talk about direct and inverse configurations, which are things that are not, uh, actually they, they are mentioned briefly in some papers uh, in the literature, but they're not really picked up in the grammars on Guarani. I also talk about an anti-passive voice and I cut out the reference of the traditional terms for this, but this is called sometimes objective voice in, in the traditional grammars. Uh, but I, I went through with my analysis of this voice as an anti-passive. I explained a little bit what anti-passives do. Um, the grammar isn't, because it's a reference grammar, it's not, it doesn't have a lot of analytical content, but it has enough, I think, so that uh, a trained reader can, if, any, if nothing else, be very curious about what exactly, uh, um, how exactly this analysis function in the grammar of the whole language. And I am not going to talk anymore about all of the middle of the grammar, which is a big, uh, mostly form to meaning sequence of chapters, although there are some chapters that are, have more of a meaning to form approach, like the quantification chapter. Um, but I do want to end by telling you uh, that I included some sections that are maybe often usually included as appendices to grammars, but I thought they were so important that I, I did not want to give the impression that they were somehow uh, tacked on or additional, but non-essential. Um, information. And because Guarani is such a vibrant language that has, that is so widely used across so many different domains, I thought it was important to include a, a chapter on text samples from very different kinds of registers that use Guarani. So for example, section one is about interviews. And so this is an excerpt from an interview that I did in my field work in 2013. And you can see here that Contrary to what I did in the rest of the grammar here, the elements from Spanish in this whole chapter are clearly set off with boldface. Um, so this is an interview uh, from my field work. This is a narrative from the first novel ever written in Guarani by Tadeo Sarratea. It's called Calaito Pombero. It's from 1981. I'm not going to read it because I don't have time, but it's such a beautiful passage. It is really, read it quickly in English. It's really a very beautiful passage. It's the beginning of, beginning of the novel. It's my translation. <laughs> uh, maybe somebody can take issue with some of the ways I translated some of the things here. Um, in that case, let me know. Um, this is poetry, uh, a poem from Susi Delgado, which is one of the most important poets in Paraguayan literature, and she writes a lot on Guarani, and it's also, if you can read the second column quickly, it is so, it is so beautiful. Uh, I mean, all her poetry is really amazing, Susi Delgado, and I really recommend it. Um, I have theater. This is from Felix de Guarania, the author of one of the grammars I referenced before. So there's also uh, a, a much a larger text sample from theater. This is from a newspaper. The biggest uh, newspaper in, in Paraguay, the ABC, has a section that's completely in Guarani 
called ABC Remiandus or news, ABC News. Um, and so I gave an example of that language here in, in, the, code, in the code mixing or the mixed lect with um, Spanish and a translation by myself into English. And um, I, I want to really finish because I want us to have time for some questions, but I thought I also included, there's a section I'm not going to talk about of uh, a list of paradigms and a mini glossary of terms ordered thematically that I think are important uh, too in the grammar. But I also included sayings, what the Paraguayans called nienga, which I thought had to figure in the grammar just because they're items of such cultural relevance. And I know that there's been a talk at this conference about um, proverbs. And I think the, the, uh, the inclusion of these kinds of culturally relevant uh, genres is extremely important in a reference grammar. Information structure, very quickly, I thought I would include a section on something that hasn't really been studied almost at all in, in Guarani. Uh, the only paper on information structure I know is by Cynthia Klopper and Judith Tonhauser, The Prosody of Focus in Paraguayan Spanish. It's a great paper in Paraguayan Guarani, sorry. It's a great paper, but that's all there is. So I took elements of my corpus of data and I tried to exemplify uh, give a mini analysis of focus and topic strategies in Guarani. And I did it mostly as a tantalizing chapter because this could be improved in so many ways. So I think it's very important that we include uh, discourse and information structure um, uh, content in our reference grammar and that those of us who work on related Guarani or related languages perhaps need to work on this a little bit more. And I know of somebody who just wrote me that is working on Kamayura, who is interested in some aspects of uh, fronting constituents and so on. Future. What happens with the future of writing grammars? Uh, one minute for this. I was uh, surprised at how relatively little there is on grammaticography theory. Like if you want to read about how to write grammars or what is important, there is some a lot of it comes from Europe. Uh, I don't think in the US much attention is paid to this as a theorizing subfield. I think we got to work on grammaticography and how to write grammars a little bit more perhaps. How do we integrate our grammars for the future with the new technologies? Can we link it to audio? Can we link it to video? How do we do it? And by the same token, how do we improve the navigational um, options for a reader of our grammars. How do we do that in a way that is manageable for both the publishers, the writers, and the readers? And that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Thank you again to Lily and Rita this, and the UCL press team. I had a blast. Thank you very much. Uh, part of the data collection and work on this book was founded by a National Endowment for the Humanities grant. And I wanted to thank my native speaker consultants and in particular, my colleague, um, um, Ernesto Almada, who provided some good checks on some of my translations throughout the grammar. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Bruno, for a keynote that was everything that we could have imagined or hoped for. Um, you talked about all of the issues that we um, were kind of imagining that we would, uh, we would like to be covered. Um, so this was just exactly according to our vision, much, much as with the grammar book itself. Um, so I should mention, we've already got quite a lively discussion going on in the chat, and um, I'll open up in a minute for um, questions and comments. Um, but I just wanted to say um, initially that all of these issues about, um, you know, audio and about the kind of pedagogical um, sort of versus um, linguistic, um, traditional linguistic approach um, were like kind of everything that, that Bruno um, did was in consultation with us and was also sort of according to our overall vision for the series. So um, if, there, if there are any criticisms about that, they should really be directed at me and Rita, <laughs> because um, this is, you know, we kind of, uh, everything that sort of that Bruno decided was totally in line with what we were hoping for um, from this grammar as well. 
but we would also like there to be audio. Um, and we're just um, uh, kind of working on how to do that technically with, uh, with ECL Press. Um, so I just wanted to put in a little disclaimer uh, because there's been discussion about, you know, like kind of the best way to do that and um, whether grammar should be written at all or should be kind of part of a larger corpus. And so these are all really interesting, bigger issues. So um, let's open up to questions. I'm just trying to go back to the first one. Um, so there is a question from uh, Javier about what the profile is of people who are learning Guarani as a second language. Um, Javier, did you want to ask that yourself or is that, did, did I kind of cover it enough? As in like, are there any who don't understand Spanish, etc.? If you want well, to mute yourself. I, I think I can go uh, off of, of that and Javier, if you have any follow-ups or I misinterpreted something, you can let me know. Um, the profile is most people who learn Guarani as not members of the community, right? Because there are also monolingual speakers of Spanish who learn Guarani, but they are in some sort of they're Paraguayans who are members of the community. Uh, missionaries and people working with the Peace Corps, for example, are the uh, biggest constituency that learns Guarani in Paraguay uh, from the U.S. Um, in Argentina, Argentina has the largest expat population uh, in the world of Paraguayans and also has its own local varieties of Guarani that are quite close to Paraguayan Guarani, Correntino Guarani, for example, or Mba in, in Misiones. Um, and uh, those uh, provinces in Argentina and many universities, and this is a section of the grammar as well, many universities in Argentina actually uh, provide courses of Guarani for the general public and people who are just interested in, in the language and role. Um, but by and large from the US, it's missionaries, Peace Corps volunteers. Great. Um, then we have a question about, um, so from Peter about, um, Grammars for native speakers. Did it, Peter? Did you want to ask your question or questions? Because you had a couple. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Thanks very much for your talk. Um, one of the uh, my comment and the question was that um, in order to support minority languages, um, a number of uh, people and places around the world are actually trying to write monolingual grammars, that is writing the grammar in the language itself. Um, mm -hmm. This strengthens the, um, can be, can serve to strengthen the language, um, mm -hmm. particularly when you find there are uh, shifting norms between say older speakers and younger speakers. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking in particular that um, for Samoan, there is a, there's a grammar of Samoan, which is actually written for school children. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, the goal there was to help the kids with um, with their style, their 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 style of reading Samoan and, and so on. And I'm wondering, in your context, whether there's any opportunity to consider uh, no, monolingual uh, grammars. Great question. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. They, in fact, I was going to say the H.O. <laughs> I was thinking in Spanish for a minute. Uh, in fact. Um, um, the academy grammar is a grammar that does that is going towards what Peter is saying here. They have um, the facing text of the Spanish text is in in Guarani. I just realized that by saying the facing text, I already gave directionality to this. Like, oh, the Spanish is primary, the Guarani is secondary. But considering that Spanish has a developed meta language and Guarani is trying to develop one, I think that view makes sense. Um, yeah, the academy, this is an important part in, in developing a met meta language to talk about, as I said before, being able to use the object language as also the meta language for your speakers. And I think I am completely behind that, as we all probably are here. One particular problem, in my opinion, uh, and I'm willing to stand corrected on this, um, in Paraguay is that 
Paraguay doesn't really have a sustained, well-trained core of linguists, right? So when the academy writes a grammar, they have a hard time um, is chewing the use of categories that are appropriate to describe Spanish and perhaps not completely appropriate to describe what I mean. So the, the, the way I viewed this grammar was that hopefully, because it's open access, first of all, a ton of people have already told me it's great that's open access. I already downloaded it. I don't know how many people downloaded it, but this is great the more the merrier and find all of the mistakes you can, please. Because one of the good things about it is that we can create a Spanish language version, right, under the Creative Commons license. And this is part of really our contribution to the community. It's like, okay, this is something that we can use to actually perhaps train people in linguistic description who are also members of the community. That is, the other counterpart of being able to write a monolingual grammar that succeeds, I think. Great, thank you. So- um, Can I, can mm -hmm. I just make one follow-up? Follow -up? Yeah. You, said there, you said there wasn't much study of grammatography, but in, in fact, I think in Europe, at least, there, there has mm -hmm. been quite a bit of work done on this in the yes. last 20 years. Yes, um, yes. There was a special issue of language documentation and conservation, I think in 2012. Um, yes. Jeff Good and some other people were involved in it. And there's, there's yes. a lot of people have been thinking about um, mm -hmm. the kinds of notions that you dealt with. Um, Absolutely. And also thinking about um, linking um, hypertextual, kind of linking um, to, to corpora, for example, so that um, you know, learners can actually hear the language spoken. You're not you're not reliant on the on just you know what's on the paper, but um, you, we can have multimedia grammars that actually have the the links to the. And I mean, there are I could give you examples of those going back uh, 12, 13 years. Nick Teberger's work in Australia, for example. Oh yes. Um, so I, I think that you're you're a little bit pe pessimistic about uh, the notion of grammar. No, no. no. Uh, you're right, but this was a relative uh, um, comment relative to, for example, lexicography or how much more is written. And I did specifically mention the difference between Europe and the U.S., so I know the U.S. situation better. In the U.S., when you do ling linguistic fieldwork or study linguistic fieldwork, you study a lot about the ethics of linguistic fieldwork, which is great, uh, ways to elicit data, document a way to document, um, sorry, what to elicit data, uh, technology to use. Comparatively speaking, and again, maybe I'm wrong, but I, my impression is that comparatively speaking, less attention is put on how you write a grammar. I know, I actually agree with you. I know the corpora and the text you're citing. There are books like Catching Language from 2006 that is specifically about writing grammars. There is stuff there, mostly from Europe. And there, there are corpora with linked audio. There's a Dobes archive. There's a TLA, for example, yes. I am, in fact, now initiating a project of documentation of my mother's native language, which is Southern Italian, in which I will create that kind of corpus. But the, my, my comment was just, why don't we study it more? Why aren't we taught more when we're students about, it's not because you're a good linguist that you can write a good grammar, as I, <laughs> oh, sorry, it's not that I'm a good linguist, but you know, writing a grammar <laughs> is hard, you know, and, and we're not taught explicitly, but yeah, Peter, I, I take your comment very seriously. You're right, you're right. This, and this is actually one of the, I mean, one of the reasons why we were very lucky having you as an author, but this is exactly the issue is that we've had to be, you know, like kind of very careful when, um, inviting people or like selecting proposals for the grammar series because exactly because we want them to be accessible and we want them to be 
um, you know, kind of able to be understood by anyone, by students, by just members of the public who want to learn the language. And there's a huge gap generally between what um, professional linguists, um, you know, kind of generally think is the approach to take and what you'd find in a lot of the grammar series that are aimed at linguists and the sort of like more, you know, like kind of popular books. And we wanted something in the middle, which could be used by either group. So it's definitely a very delicate balance and um, something that, yeah, we also feel that it should be uh, more talked about. And that was kind of one of our hopes, in fact, with this conference is to, you know, kind of look at materials um, and approaches to creating pedagogical materials. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I agree. Um, just um, time for one more question because um, there's going to be an announcement from uh, Nick Osler and the Fell Board. But um, Jürgen asked, are there differences between the quote, pure Warani uh, and the one mixed with Spanish just lexical or are they also morphological? And if they're also morphological, would that mean that you'd have to describe two different systems in one grammar? Sorry, <laughs> you, the chat distracted me for a minute. <laughs> Sorry, Lily, can you repeat that? What a bad student I am. It's too many things going on, I think. Um, uh, Jürgen, did you want to ask the question yourself? Sorry. Yeah, um, I was wondering if, if, if the Spanish mixed version has a different morphology already, or maybe it lost a lot of morphemes, or maybe it replaced yeah. some original morphemes with new ones. Do you need yeah. to describe two different systems in your grammar, the so-called pure one and the mixed one? I, uh, yes. Uh, the short answer to your question is yes. There is uh, loss of morphology, loss of um, agglutinative uh, syntax in many cases. Uh, loss is a very loaded wo word, but yeah, that's what perhaps it is. Um, I have talked about that a little bit on some of my earlier papers, but in response to your question about whether you need two systems, there's a paper that's been accepted for a special issue of Journal of Language Contact on usage-based approaches that I just finished. Um, I would like to take a rain check on answering your questions, <laughs> right? I think uh, I'm not ready. I don't know. And I'm not ready to speculate on whether you need two systems. In that paper, I tried to explore how far we could get with an explanation of uh, grammatical borrowings from Guarani into Spanish based on language, on sentence planning, based basically on models of mi micro, macro and micro planning and, and so on that are found in the literature. I am not ready to commit on whether you need two systems or whether you can do one system. What I did say in that paper was that I think there's evidence, as many other people have pointed out, uh, that conceptualization, the process of conce conceptualization of your message, if you believe that such a stage exists, that is already where language mixing took place. It's already there even before you do anything that actually overtly mixes the languages. Um, so you may have two systems, but you have one processor. That's the uh, assumption in my paper, which of, of course could be wrong, right? Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. Fantastic. I don't want, again, I always I feel like I keep saying this, I don't want to cut this short because I think it's like such an interesting discussion. Um, but um, we have to have a break before the final block of the conference. And um, before that, um, I just want to hand over to um, Nick Osler and the Fell Board. Um, so thank you so much, Bruno, for a really fantastic thank you. keynote. I, I enjoyed it so much. I didn't say anything, but I want to say it now. It was fantastic. And if anyone wants to carry on with the discussion, you could go to the break room. I don't know whether Bruno has time to go there, but it, it could continue there. And I'll go. Yeah, I'll switch off the recording now. Great. Thanks.